Good evening. I'm Mark Updegrove, President and CEO of the LBJ Foundation. Lady Bird Johnson established the Harry Middleton Lectureship in 1994 to honor the career, loyalty, and legacy of Mr. Middleton, who served in the Johnson administration as a speechwriter before going on to become the director of the LBJ Presidential Library for over 30 years. The lectureship was designed to attract and enrich the learning experience of UT students and the greater Austin community. Past speakers have included Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, President Jimmy Carter, Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, news anchor Tom Brokaw, and actor Brian Cranston. The lecture series is co-sponsored by the LBJ Presidential Library and the Lyndon Baines Johnson Foundation. This evening, we're delighted to welcome author and professor Chang Ray Lee. Chang Ray Lee is the author of Native Speaker, winner of the Hemingway Foundation Penn Award for First Fiction. He is also the author of On Such a Full Sea, A Just Your Life, A Loft, and The Surrendered, winner of the Dayton Peace Prize and a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. A 2021 winner of the Award of Merit for the novel from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, Lee teaches writing at Stanford University. His most recent book, My Year Abroad, released in paperback on February 1st, was called by the New York Times Book Review, A Manifesto to Happiness, the one found when you stop running from who you are. It was also considered a best book of the year by Vogue, Time, and Marie Claire. Tonight's conversation will be moderated by Lois Kim, the director of the Texas Book Festival. And now, please join me in welcoming Chang Ray Lee and Lois Kim. Chang Ray, congratulations on the success of My Year Abroad, one of my absolutely favorite novels of last year, and his paperback has just been released. Thank you very much, Lois. Just since the setting is here in the Brown Room of the Lyndon Baines Johnson um, Presidential Library Museum, I thought it would be appropriate for us to start with a question about your career and your life that all may be started because of this broader historical context. LBJ championed um, the Immigration Act of 1965, perhaps the most sweeping immigration reform in American history. It was the law that ended up having a direct impact on Asian families like yours and mine, um, who were part of the big immigration wave that happened after the passage of the law. So, of course, you're an accomplished novelist who's been in this country for 25 years. And you probably don't get this as the first question, but given this setting, will you share with um, our viewers today your immigration story? Mm. Well, I've been in this country 50 years. 50 years. <laughs> That's how old I am. <laughs> but I, I'm definitely a, a child of 1965. Actually, I was born in 1965. But in terms of immigration, yeah, I think we're all children of 1965, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it allowed my father, who went to medical school in Korea, to come here uh, as a medical resident. And I think he was, at the time, thinking just, you know, he'd do his training and then go back to Korea. And, but after a year, as I think it often happens, you know, he called for us. And so at that time, my my uh, sister was, I think she was maybe still in my mother's womb, mm -hmm. but but there, <laughs> about to be born, and and so we came over. Uh, so that's like um, I think I've heard that story a lot from people that mm -hmm. that I think the plan was originally just to come get some training, and of course because back then, you know, they didn't have a lot of information about what was going to be on the other side of this journey. Mm -hmm. you know, there was no internet. They didn't really have, you know, I think they had a sponsor at the hospital, but they had no friends. They had no relatives. And, and I think the, the prospect of, of making a whole new life was pretty daunting. But I think once they got here, they realized, you know, maybe we can do it. Yeah, you know? it was a leap of faith. Absolutely. And I, you know, I, I do think that partly my father also had a, had a notion that there was a little bit of a glass ceiling for him mm -hmm. back in Seoul, even though he was a medical school graduate and was going to be a doctor of some kind. His family's from the North mm -hmm. before the war. 
And I think a lot of northern, you know, northerners, as we might call them, um, kind of felt that way. Mm -hmm. That they'd never be part of the establishment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Korea is, even though there's many millions of people there, it's kind of a small country. Yes. Um, very cliquish. Yes. Um, south, North, mm -hmm. Seoul. Even then, it, even before the divide, right? Even before the divide, mm -hmm. even now, even though things are a little bit more fluid and mobile. So, so I think that was also a small impetus, maybe an important one mm -hmm. for him to think. And there wasn't already family over in the States? No one. No one. No one. No yeah. One. And so on neither side. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the Korean friends they had were just people, other people like them, maybe some professors or other medical people that they had heard about, you know, who were around. And we did not live in a Korean enclave or an ethnic enclave of any kind. We lived in, you know, suburban Westchester. Mm -hmm. and so there really weren't very many Asian people at all then. Right. Where we were. And there was, like, I grew up in Buffalo and there was a, you know, Korean church that was that enclave and there was a community there, but in Westchester that was not the case. No, and we went to, we went across the Sound to Queens and where the, there was a Korean church. That, yes. You know, and that was pr pretty much the mother church mm -hmm. of the whole area. And my parents, you know, they weren't religious people. It was a cultural, yeah, it was a cultural yeah, draw, yeah, right? Yeah, a they, place to feel like you had some community. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to say they just went through the motions, mm -hmm. but um, but that wasn't really their passion. Right. Yeah. Well, this is, you know, my question about being an immigrant, and maybe it's hard to answer because, you know, you've had the experience that you've had in your life, but do you think that influenced you to become a writer? I mean, if you had stayed in Korea, would I be talking to Dr. Dr. Lee, you know, <laughs> yeah. taking, you know yeah. working on his next <laughs> yeah. appendicitis. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I think, you know, it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think I was always somebody who enjoyed the artistic pursuits, mm -hmm. mostly because I didn't like to follow assignments. Mm -hmm. And so I have a feeling that I would have always done something that was kind of outside the lines. Mm -hmm. Uh, what outside of what probably would be prescribed. I think though the writing part, you know, that came about I think because of all the reading I did when I was a kid. And part of that reading was because my parents were so keen on my learning English. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably the same with you. Very much. And you know, they were so afraid mm -hmm. that we'd never learn English well enough and that, you know, there was a different attitude back then about English as a second language. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> it was like it's, you know, it's your ticket to survival. Right. You know, and 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 my parents didn't speak English that well. No, neither did mine. Right. Right. And and so they weren't, you know, they they entrusted both of us, my my sister and I, mm -hmm. to to, you know, all the professionals you know, the teachers, and we, we really depended upon them. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I remember in school, my first grade teacher who was, um, I guess the first teacher I had when I spoke English, because the kindergarten year, I didn't speak any English. Because, you know, we, we just grew up at home. Mm -hmm. We didn't really go to school. And so, you know, I was just speaking Korean. And, you know, apparently I was a pretty good Korean speaker, mm -hmm. probably much better then than I am now. But, um, but I remember my first grade teacher uh, telling my mother that um, I should read as much as possible and that uh, she would, uh, you know, give me all these books. Mm -hmm. And then they had some kind of contest. And I think I won the contest that year for, you know, reading more books than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was kind of proud of that. But, but really, it was my mother's, uh, you know, her their, scheme. Their to, scheme. They <laughs> were anxious. They wanted to make sure that, and at that time, it was a lot about assimilation and be American and totally, speak English. Totally. Yes. You know, there wasn't any, right. she wasn't, I think she had her own private worries and, and probably sadness that I wasn't speaking Korean. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was far outweighed by, you know, how quickly my sister and I, you know, were integrating into mm -hmm. our lives, you know, at least lingu language wise. <laughs> yes. And, and have you been able to keep you know, I think of your command of the English language, and it's, Chang Wei, it's truly remarkable. I mean, I feel like you go into every nook and cranny of 
the entire breadth of what English language has to offer. And do you feel like that came at a cost of losing some of your Korean language facility, or are you pretty bilingual? No, I'm not bilingual, but mm -hmm. I don't think it, I don't think that was the reason why I lost my Korean. I lost my Korean because I just never spoke it. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't have a grandma or grandfather in the house who didn't speak English. Most of my friends who still speak Korean, my age, you know, same generation immigrants, the ones who speak Korean well are the ones who had to. Yes. You know, just to communicate with, a, you know, a family member. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I did not live in a Korean enclave. Mm -hmm. I didn't. So, so that's really, yeah, I just didn't, didn't have practice. I think if we'd had K-dramas back then, mm -hmm. We probably would be speaking more Korean instead of Brady Bunch and Love right. Boat and you know Happy Days, Gilligan's Island, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Were that same TV way <laughs> yeah. of I think we're very close yeah. in age. Yeah. yeah, and so, but I think also because I learned the language and I very distinctly remember those those times and those feelings and the you know the, it was kind of stressful, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you spend a whole year and you it's just things are just gradually dawning on you and mm -hmm. and suddenly you have it and then and then I think you know part of me was just had an affinity for language maybe mm -hmm. you know my parents did say that I spoke Korean very very well for a kid so I, I think I always enjoyed language and probably you know like a lot of immigrant and immigrant writers do they throw themselves into the language mm -hmm. you know Conrad yes uh, Nabokov right uh, and I think it's because of a certain kind of maybe a little anxiety, mm -hmm. but also, um, you know, the passion of somebody who's um, coming to something where it's fresh and new and different and it's not just a given thing. Yes. You know, we're all, I think writers are, are always conscious, very conscious of their language, at least on the page. And, but I think immigrants are very conscious of their language, too. And, and, and are very attuned to the way people speak, mm -hmm. are very attuned to accents, um, because that's how, you know, that's how they just see the world. Yeah. yeah. And there's a little bit of otherness that you're bringing to it, like, you know, the, the sense of, you know, being an immigrant and paying attention and feeling of it and a little bit outside of it. Absolutely. Yes. You know, being more observer than participant, mm -hmm. which I was for, you know, the first probably two years of my English speaking life. Mm -hmm. What is, um, I'm a little loath to ask this question because it's sort of a, you know, to ask about what it's like to write as an Asian American writer when, of course, this is the identity that you've always had. So I don't know that you can answer the question of um, what it's like um, because it's just the experience that you've always had. But, you know, of course, you're often described as an Asian American writer, very important in the Asian American um, canon. You know, what to you today, you know, feels like what are you tired about thinking about and being asked about in terms of being an Asian American writer and what still feels really enduring and important about that identity? I don't think I feel tired about thinking about anything mm -hmm. because those are the things that are just naturally going to appear, or occur to me, bug me, mm -hmm. disturb me. You know, the, all those questions about otherness, about belonging, about, you know, feeling as if, you know, you lead multiple lives at the same time. And, but, you know, sometimes it's more about responding to people's expectations of what either they th thought you wrote mm -hmm. or they think you should write. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of my students have this you know, have this sort of quarrel with themselves too, particularly my Asian American students. Like, should I be writing about certain things? They ask me and I always say, of course not. You should write about your particular experience. Part of which of course is mm -hmm. somebody who looks this way in this place in time in, you know, universal history, <laughs> right? Um, because it's all about context. Right. Um, you, what you're going to be writing about will be absolutely different than what I'm going to be writing about. Even if we're the same race, even if we're the same ethnic, have the same national background, even if we even grew up in the same neighborhood, 
I think there's still a mm. universe of difference between us. You teach a Asian American literature class at Stanford? Yeah. And what is the makeup of that, of the students there? Well, because there are so many Asian American students at Stanford, um, they, most of the students are Asian American, <laughs> of, of all of all kinds. Yes, and it's a it's a really wonderful class because I think it's the class itself demonstrates to the students how diverse their experience really is, mm -hmm. and it, and 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 more importantly, how diverse their ways of thinking are. Mm -hmm. Well, and we were talking when I we were driving back from the airport about how I mean. I was an English major, you were an English major, and you were talking about how there aren't that many English majors at Stanford anymore. So aside from the great variety of students of different kinds of Asian backgrounds that are in your class, but they might not be English majors because there aren't that many English majors at Stanford. And I wanted to ask you, you know, you're a teacher, you're on the forefront of what's happening in higher education today with some of the brightest students um, in the country and the world. You know, what what is it like teaching in the university today when you have this tension between the humanities, perhaps the shrinking humanities, and then here you are in you know, a university that's known as a tech incubator in a very tech epicenter of the world. Um, although Austin might be giving uh, Palo Alto a <laughs> run for its money. And that tension, you know, what are you, what are you seeing and how are you feeling about that? I don't think it's just a Stanford problem being in Silicon Valley. I know that you know, hearing from colleagues in smaller liberal arts colleges back east and where I taught at Princeton before Stanford, the same issue. Mm -hmm. There's so, f there are so fewer students who get into the humanities from the start. And, and you know, for especially at the so-called elite colleges, where you know they they you know the it's it's a, it's a function of also that they can draw from socioeconomic backgrounds that right because of their wealth and because of their endowments they can they can draw a, a you know a lot of students from backgrounds that are you know they don't come from any kind of money and and particularly the students that I have say that Asian American autobiograph autobiography class so many of those students have had all these interests. They loved theater, they loved painting, they loved music, they loved writing, they loved poetry. But once they get to this point in their lives and have an idea that, oh my goodness, you know, my, my dad and mom ran the dry cleaners, mm -hmm. they did not send me here. To be an English major. To be an English major. Mm -hmm. And I completely understand that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I I can see why you know that's such a hard choice for them. Mm -hmm. um, the I think it's just the way that the our our society and our you know our world economy is going, and so I I don't know what to say about it. You said you mentioned the word tension. I don't think there is a tension. I think the humanities are dying because I do know that the, the students that we have in creative writing in the English department because I'm in the English department. And, but we also have our creative writing program within that, and we serve a lot of students. We serve actually very a lot more students than the English department mm -hmm. does for their traditional courses. Um, and you know that that's not a surprise because students love to write. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that most of the people who end up becoming majors in the English department come through creative writing, mm -hmm. and because they they love creative writing. And then of course when you when you practice it, when you talk about it, you, you then you know, think, you know what, I should, I should expand my reading. <laughs> I, should have a, I should have a foundation in all this. And so maybe that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's the way, is it encourage the arts, arts, maybe even just arts making first. Mm -hmm. you know, it used to be the other way around, right? You studied, you learned all the traditions, you read the canon, or you, you know. And then for the chosen few, deemed by whoever, um, you got to practice. Now, because of the way the culture is, everyone's making art everywhere, TikTok, Instagram, but that's okay. But maybe we can, you know, channel all that good energy. And I think as we're doing in our, our program and getting kids, you know, back into, you know, just a literary study. 
It's a democratization, you know, of art making that it's not that you need the degree, you just need to do it from my vantage point. It seems like in publishing there are more books being published than ever, you yes. know, and, and maybe that's part of the, you know, commerce aspect of, of publishing and, you know, here we are in this kind of stage of capital late stage capitalism and globalization and so we do see the arts, you know, taking off, but perhaps it's just as you say, not happening in the university in this in the traditional ways yeah. um, and you're in a position where you're both in the academy and outside of it as a novelist a successful novelist um, does this stuff find its way into your work you know and your preoccupations as a as a as a you know novelist who's publishing who has this um, paperback version of a very successful novel um, come out is that are you kind of like on both sides of that equation? I try not to mm -hmm. uh, mix my worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the the work I do in my school office is um, all about the students. You know, to to present to them the literature that I think will be most you know provocative and and in some ways lasting. Mm -hmm. And, and then in ter talking about their work, you know, I'm kind of, you know, their therapist, right? <laughs> I'm, it, I'm there to, to try to bring out the ideal forms of what they're trying to do mm -hmm. and to steer them here and, you know, to massage their, their direction, you know, in, in a certain way. Um, I, I, I hope I don't ever become a gatekeeper of any mm -hmm. kind. Um, but in my work at my desk at home, that's necessarily exertions that are are really intense, very private, and where I really want to block out the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, the world is, of course, in me because of everything I am, read, you know, just as we all are. But, but at that point, I don't want to ever hear anything about writing, mm -hmm. quote unquote, say the craft. I don't want to hear about, you know, any kind of suggestion of what, I might do because of some other hat I have. Mm -hmm. um, so, because, because for me, the the pursuit of of novel writing is is about complete liberty. Mm -hmm. It's a freedom. It's about complete freedom, and and that's probably the best thing about it, truly. Well, it's also um, a great a great boon to your readers who who get to read it. And let's dig a little bit more into my year abroad. Um, Again, a book that I, I, I truly loved. Um, it's, it's an adventure tale that the New York Times described as a wild ride picaresque, wisecracking, funny, ambitious, full of sex and danger. Um, you have some epigraphs at the beginning of the novel, um, one being from Thomas Mann's novel, Confessions of Felix Krull, Confidence Man. He who truly loves the world shapes himself to please it. Will you explain that choice and how it kind of, you know, as epigraphs do, create a little springboard for the reader to dive in? Right. I mean, that's a great, I, I love that line from, from Krull. Uh, obviously, it's a confidence man's line also, right? I mean, because the confidence man is, is the zealot. He, he'll, he'll be and, and, and conduct himself or she will or her conduct herself in in the perfect way where she, where they're the key for any lock mm -hmm. any any lock that comes comes about right in the form of a person in the form of some scheme in the form and so there is a mercenary and and um, you know um, uh, a kind of you know a sense that of course they want to master the moment but I like the other side of it too which is you know it's not just about getting over something on the world. It's about actually connecting with it, mm -hmm. right? It's about actually being uh, the, you know, a, a more beautiful side of that, of that universal key. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that, you know, we can go anywhere and if we're really truly open, if we're really truly curious, if we're really truly vulnerable in the best ways, then, experience can be magical. And it, it, we might put on a persona to fit into this other experience that we would otherwise not be able to have. Well, yeah, we don't always have to be so locked in mm -hmm. to this idea of oneself, 
right? Because that's really our, I mean, people say, oh, yeah, I'm this way. But if you really think about it, they're probably mostly, I think I'm this way. Yeah. So <laughs> who's your, who's, who's, the confidence man is Pong. Or is it? I'm not sure it is. Uh -huh. You know, I think, I think, you know, the, the young hero of this novel, Tiller, is trying to, is becoming, you know, or gaining an understanding that, that maybe we're all confidence men mm -hmm. if we actually have open hearts. You know, he, he's, I guess the confidence man, of course, in, in the traditional sense is, again, someone who's going to gain advantage. Mm -hmm. But in this novel, I think that the gaining of advantage is, about, is not about taking, but about experiencing. And experiencing something about the world, experiencing something about the other way, the ways that other people think mm -hmm. and and believe things are, and and wh and whether or not that leads to always pleasure or enlightenment uh, or or something else um, is okay. Uh, so I think I think Tiller is somebody who has completely ceded, you know, himself to the idea that. The, the possibilities are worth it mm -hmm. wherever they lead them, in, even to dark places. And let's back up for a minute for viewers who haven't read My Year Abroad yet, like set it up a little bit so that they know who these characters are, right? Well, there's, uh, the, the narrator of the novel is a, a young fellow named Tiller Bardman. He's 20 years old. He's one-eighth Korean, mm -hmm. seven-eighths, you know, European-American. And, uh, and he's uh, on a, on his junior year and, and about to go on a typical semester abroad, probably to Europe. But before that happens, he meets a local businessman, a Chinese fellow named Pong Lu, who is uh, kind of a famed local entrepreneur with lots of businesses. And they become friendly and, and Pong says, why don't you come along with me and help me on some business ventures that I have uh, instead of going off on your doing your thing and and Tiller is just at that point in his life when I think he feels like sure I definitely want to do this I, I, I don't want to do what everyone else is doing because it's he's already bored by it mm -hmm. he's bored by the thought of it of course he's also looking for something right he there's some void in his life and uh, emotional void mm -hmm. um, ha having to do mostly probably with his family life and lots of things that that didn't happen and so they go off together and on a lot of uh, crazy crazy adventures crazy stuff, happens. <laughs> <laughs> stuff that I didn't even know would happen uh, uh, but I think uh, I think uh, that was right that I yeah. didn't know because I think if I didn't know before that's the funny thing about writing novels sometimes mm -hmm. if you knew before what you were going to write you probably wouldn't write it you're not a writer who has the end in mind and knows it. There are writers who are that way, right? That sure. that they've got it all sure. plotted out. We all out. have different ways of thinking. Sure, of course. Yeah. yeah. And but my my what I'm comfortable with is um, in terms, especially with with character and psyche, uh, and as it has to do with where what's going to happen to them in plot. I'm pretty associative. I don't plan mm -hmm. out. I just feel my way into it. And and try to have faith in in where my gut is telling me mm -hmm. to go with them. And I've heard you say in in interviews that you often do start with character, right? And that there, in this case, you know, there was Pong, there's Tiller. Can you dig a little bit more into that process of you're feeling your way into it, but then what is that? How does that roll out? Like, what does that look like? over time as you're feeling that out, like building that character and then how does it turn into a narrative and then how does it turn into this complete novel? Well, you, you certainly need to start out with a fairly good foundation for what you believe that person is like. Mm -hmm. um, the, way, the style of their thinking, maybe even the sound of their voice um, and the way that they would describe themselves, both externally Mm -hmm. and then internally so but that doesn't mean that you know if if a hundred percent we're absolutely knowing everything about that person which of course you can never get to anyway mm -hmm. um, 
I would say that I probably start out a novel knowing probably 35% of what really makes this person this person, what makes them tick, what, but it's only in pushing them and putting them in situations that are going to challenge, rub up against, um, corroborate, sometimes reveal, you know, as, as paradoxical, some part of their psyche, some part of their makeup. And, you know, we are, we're all, you know, creatures of what's happened to us, mm -hmm. how we've been raised, who's been there, who's not been there, um, I, creatures of context. So I, I think um, I, as a novelist, I'm always trying to constantly put that character in a dynamic set of series of contexts. Mm -hmm. And so that, so that I'm always looking for, well, what should happen next to this person so that some other part of them will be revealed or clarified mm -hmm. or refuted even. Um, so for me, yes, there's plot, but the plot makes no difference if we don't continually have, you know, a deeper and more profound kind of appreciation for who this person is mm -hmm. and why they're telling us this story. Uh, and so that's what I tell my students is, yeah. it's not that you have this character and then you just put them into situations. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a murder mystery mm -hmm. where it's just like who done it, right? Mm -hmm. As I tell my students, I want to know why they done it. Mm -hmm. I want to know how they think they're going to done it, <laughs> <laughs> right? I want to know, you know, what they thought they had done mm -hmm. when they done it. And all those things are the things that make up, I think, you know, a, a really rich character in a rich novel. And the context that you're putting them in, it's all about that tension is in this novel. So I feel like we're on the precipice of this, this capitalist excessive culture on the verge of collapse but in its fullness of, you know, insanity, right? Of, 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 of commerce and globalism and, and everything that it involves. It is incredibly entertaining to read, but it's also quite dark. Um, well, I do try to, and I think I do this in many of my novels, um, I try to pervert things a little bit, mm -hmm. and not necessarily sexually, right? But, but a certain kind of perversion where it's, it becomes dark, strange, mm -hmm. Um, very idiosyncratic. Yes, I, and, there were things I read that I didn't even know existed. <laughs> yes, <Dang Ray. laughs> yeah. um, and and that I thought would be um, appropriate to this young fellow's journey. Mm -hmm. That yeah, it could you know it's not simply just wealth and luxury mm -hmm. and finding out wow look how rich these people are and look how powerful they are. It's for me I had to investigate well look how human these people are mm -hmm. look how messed up they are look how obsessive they are about things that um, they believe are important mm -hmm. and that believe that will shape them uh, and that you know the, the novel in the end is is a novel of maturation about about coming into the world mm -hmm. but as I always say about this novel the world also enters Tiller in many ways, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, he shaped himself to please it, uh, yes. but he's allowed the world to absolutely inundate him. Mm -hmm. And, and it's a, you know, it's a clarifying and, um, uh, I think in many ways, traumatic experience. For mm -hmm. him. Yeah. Yes. These characters that you're building, it, you know, in these very, you know, world building novels. And I kind of want to turn back to some of your other work. Um, this novel is, is it a departure, do you feel like it's a, a big departure from your most recent novel before On Such a Full Sea? That's a speculative fiction novel that's got a kind of dystopian, you know, society that is really telling the story of um, what has happened to society. And it also feels kind of realistic, like it could happen. You know, it also involves China. You know, how are these novels talking to each other? I think the, the previous novel on such a full sea is also kind of a, 
adventure novel in a way. The, the, the young heroine fan is set out into the world, a dangerous world, mm -hmm. a strange, mm -hmm. um, bizarre world at times, a very sad world at times. And so I think this, the stories have that in common. I mean, I think my novels, I think on the, it could be said that on the, on the surface of things, they're completely different. Mm -hmm. I've written about immigrants, I've written about war, I've written about sexual slavery, I've written about environmental disaster. But I think, you know, the thing that, that ties them all is that it's really not about all that. It's about how someone usually trapped in a certain context, is trying to figure out who they are in this new context mm -hmm. or in this pressurized context. And whether it's war, whether it's being an immigrant, whether it's being you know, a, a, a young girl in, in a very dangerous world, uh, and, and seeing and trying to take steps in, psychically to understand that relationship they have with their context and to see their way to another stage of who they might be. Mm -hmm. I think all the books are about that. Mm -hmm. And they have vastly different stories, but, but ultimately, I think they all go back to that. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that, you know, I was thinking of some of your earlier works and that there is a lot of war, right? And you've taken, you know, taken some of the big wars of the 20th century and they explore the effects of those war on the psyches of the very human characters that 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 you're providing for your reader is it feel like that is a little bit not your interest in war in the same way now like the 21st century wars that we're dealing with you know they're kind of ambiguous a war on terror you know um, places that are wars that are really different than the wars of the 20th century. Are those in your psyche at all? Are you thinking about like, you know, Afghanistan and Syria and are those things that you're dwelling on or have you kind of moved beyond that topic in the way that you treated it in your earlier novels, even though they're all the same story like you're saying, right? There's a universality to what your characters are dealing with. Yeah, I think there were more characters. My interest in, in those wars specifically the Pacific War, World War II, and the, you know, in the Asian uh, continent, and, and the Korean War, they derive from the character, my interest in those characters. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that, so, so unless I find another character, say, you know, who finds, it, who he or she finds herself in the Middle East, mm -hmm. That's when I think I'd be interested in in a certain kind of conflict, um, you know, a particular one that one of the ones you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But uh, but no, I, I I I try not to. I don't I don't think about topics mm -hmm. of interest really. Mm -hmm. I think about quandaries of humanness, mm -hmm. and then and then look for. A particular soul in a particular time and place and say huh even if it's speculative huh okay let's see let's start the ball rolling and let's see where that goes mm -hmm. and those quandaries of humanness are the universal ones like our relationship with our parents or it, it, it include it should include everything yes right even if it's a war novel mm -hmm. it's going to be a novel about companionship or about family or about love it's all the same thing <laughs> it's all about our 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 connection and disconnection mm -hmm. to others and but those things the, the you know the important thing about connection is that it can be so warped mm -hmm. by circumstance right mm -hmm. and and i think i guess that's where as a novelist i'm most excited and most interested i'm we i'm looking and writing that warp mm -hmm. looking at and, and writing that warp and 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 tracking it and describing it mm -hmm. as it expresses itself in other scenes 
other incidents in that in that character's mm. life. Uh, and that for me is that for me, you know, it gives me confidence that I'll never run out of things to write about because that's always present. Right. That's always present. Yeah. And you know, I tell my students. You can write about a life, one particular life once. Mm -hmm. You can write about someone's, the, the, the life of a consciousness an infinite number of times. Mm -hmm. so that's why sometimes, you know, you have a writer write a great autobiographical novel, but they're writing about that life. Right. That particular life. <laughs> but that's, I hope that's not what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. So there's an endless, an endless well and an endless reservoir for that larger question. It's endless. Yeah. The, the problem is choosing one that you have passion for and that you feel that you can, you can discover something interesting about. And it's, has, has two years of pandemic and, and sort of isolation had changed that calculus for you in terms of things that inspire you or you know, the human, human dilemmas that could become that character that you're going to, you know, explore. Has that been affected by just not being around people and not seeing people? Uh, yeah, I, uh, it's hard because I, I tend to be a, quite a social person. Um, so I depend on that both just as a, you know, just in my everyday life for, for fulfillment and happiness. But but absolutely, as a writer, <laughs> you know, I, and so that was a little tough. Mm -hmm. That was a little tough. Uh, I don't like to write about, you know, some writers are very writing about other books and writing about other stories that they love and, mm -hmm. and essentially writing about other kinds of characters and um, literary modalities. Mm -hmm. And I'm not that kind of writer. Mm -hmm. I, I really do love people mm -hmm. in, you know and not i love them in, you, you know, know what i'm I talking sense about that. i mean you go all in on <laughs> i it's i love i love how characters. people yeah. are mm -hmm. even as ugly as they can be i find it fascinating yeah. to no end and so but reading about that in the paper like, as we did in the pandemic mm -hmm. you know just constantly just being at one at a remove from that is frustrating mm -hmm. and I just love going places and talking to people and and li mostly listening and yeah. just watching so that's more your inspiration than reading you know all all writers are huge readers right and I know you're of a course huge reader. of course but mm -hmm. but but we write for different reasons mm -hmm. right and and some writers as you know are are into writing about the act of storytelling about mm -hmm. the tradition of literature you know of of certain novels about what you know, I, I, I'm not really that way, right? Or I, or I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Who, are you in conversation with any writers now that you're really enjoying, like that are sort of, you know, I, I always like to ask what, what, what you're reading that is kind of you know whether it whether it has anything to do with what you're writing or not, just what you're enjoying. Well, I enjoy so. I mean, I really enjoy so many different things. I, I have um, two recent uh, folks who went through our Stegner Fellows program mm -hmm. at Stanford. Uh, the Wallace Stegner program is a wonderful creative writing program that we have for kind of a postdoc program. People yeah. already have advanced degrees, and they're often well published already. If not a full book, then lots of you know journal publications mm -hmm. and such. And two of the folks who have recently been in the program and published books, two um, short story collections. Uh, I love both of them so much. Mm -hmm. One is by Yun Choi. It's called Skinship. I don't know if you know that book. Mm -mm. Um, I think it was just it a, I think it might have been just shortlisted for a Penn Hemingway. Nice. And the other uh, story collection is by a writer named Kate Folk mm -hmm. uh, called Out There. Mm -hmm. And there, you couldn't have two com more different collections. <laughs> you know, Skinship is, uh, Yun writes like, you know, Alice Munro mm -hmm. and, and William Trevor. Yeah, mm -hmm. and she, you know, her, her, her 
her stories are so elegant and and quiet um but penetrating um just full of just beautiful human moments and so humane um and and center around Korean immigrant experience, um, but in a way that, you know, is new and different. Mm -hmm. Kate Folk's stories are just, you know, they they kind of a border on science fiction, mm -hmm. um, but they're to me they're exciting because they're so about as all great science fiction is. They're absolutely about human possibility. Mm -hmm. And, and the way that she creates her characters, some of them are literally robots mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> of a kind, androids or something. Uh, yeah, I've, I, I learned so much about how we are by reading her very, very strange stories. Mm -hmm. so, so those are two, two story collections that, that couldn't be more different from one another, but, but I find them both very exciting and... and and, and that know, that feels op that feels optimistic about your excitement about new writers coming up and coming and doing interesting work despite our earlier dark dark sense of the fate of the humanities in <laughs> yeah. in, in the university that there is still such an important role for books in our lives like what they do and and that there's a place for them to thrive i ju i just hope that we can get them in front of mm -hmm. as many people as possible because once people, you don't have to be a literati to enjoy these stories. And that's the great thing about literature. You don't need to be. You don't need to be some kind of, right, book monk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's one of the biggest hurdles to overcome is I think people feel intimidated and that they, about the idea about reading, but really it, it is just a pleasure. It you is know? just a pleasure. It is, it just, is just a, a pleasure, pleasure that makes you a better person yeah. 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 <laughs> and makes, makes all of us better, you know? So I do think that's, that's, that's still something that, of course, we, we all believe in and, and advocate for. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Chang Ray. It's been a delight to um, talk with you, and um, I feel that, you know, siblinghood of just having a very similar immigration story and and a kind of optimism about you know we 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 came to this country our families did and there was a lot of opportunity here in in being here and it's it's always a kind of duality to still be pondering these questions of being being immigrants and um, exploring our our identities in this larger sort of American landscape are you, can you share at all what you've been working on? Um, is there anything? Well, to I just I'm working on a new novel, and I don't love to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Too soon. Yeah, too soon. It's always too soon. Right. It's always too soon until <laughs> it's out. Yeah. Well, we'll look forward to um, when that happy moment arrives, because uh, we're we're I'm such a big fan of your writing and have really enjoyed um, the opportunity to talk with you today. No, oh, thanks a lot, Lois. It's been great. My thanks to Chang Ray Lee and Lois Kim for that inspiring conversation. The store at the LBJ Presidential Library is selling signed paperback copies of My Year Abroad. You can purchase copies at lbjstore.com. Amplify Austin, the biggest 24-hour giving event in Central Texas, begins on March 2nd and runs through March 3rd. During those 24 hours, you'll have an opportunity to support and amplify the work of more than 700 local nonprofits, including the LBJ Foundation and its education programs. Visit AmplifyATX.org to see what the LBJ Foundation is doing to support civics education for our nation's youth. And we're very excited to resume our in-person programming in the coming months. I'm delighted to announce three of our upcoming speakers. New York Times op-ed columnist and author, David Brooks will be on hand on April 4th, Former U.S. Congressman Will Hurd will join us on April 11th, and author and podcast host Julia Swag will be our guest on May 11th. We hope to see you for those events and others, and I'm Mark Updegrove, hoping to see you soon.